with Tom and progress. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first um, Mapping Ancient Africa online seminar of uh, 2023. I am delighted to introduce to you Celine Vidal of the uh, University of Cambridge, and she's going to be talking to us about uh, her recent, well, relatively recent publication on the age of the oldest known Homo sapiens from Eastern Africa. Celine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity to speak today. It's a uh, fairly on a geological timescale. It's fairly recent. The paper was published exactly a year and a week ago. And I, I just it, it's good to revive this, this moment. My first memory was my mom calling me Thursday a year and a week ago saying, is that not why your name is all over the science news? Um, and it was a funny moment of 24, hour, uh, 24 hours of glory, I feel a bit like Lady Gaga. Um, so I'm going to talk today about this paper. There's a, a follow-up paper that came, out, uh, that came out a little later in the year last year, which um, I will take some things in as well for the, the context. Uh, before I uh, crack on, I just want to um, mention, if, I, if it lets me move slides, yes. Um, that this uh, work is part, a small part of a big project that was initiated in 2016 by Clive Oppenheimer in the top left corner of the, the screen and that involved many collaborators all around the world. Um, you can probably spot the geologists, those that have a bit silly pictures here. <laughs> um, and I'm really uh, grateful for all the contributions and in the, the bottom right, uh, photo is all the Chabahar team, which you can you can't see all the faces. Some of you re 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 recognize uh, yourselves, but obviously it's been critical for all the work we've done, all these collaborations. So uh, possibly a familiar um, photo, satellite photo of a part, the yeah, the, a part of the the African Rift Valley, uh, which is very famous for many uh, reasons. It, it's um, dramatic features, and also the history of mankind. There's something that is not obvious on those uh, on this photo. It, it, it is, um, they are the volcanoes. Um, and as a volcanologist, I am very excited about volcanoes. So if we plot them here, um, we can see that there are many, many volcanoes in the East African Rift. And um, it's not the first feature we think about when we think about the East African Rift. So um, one of the reasons for that is because until the recent years, volcanism has been fairly poorly studied in the in the area, uh, especially in the older regions where volcanism hasn't been a, a prominent uh, hazard. So one of the big questions, initial questions of our project was how all the big eruptions and all the volcanoes might have shaped the habitability of the rift for our ancestors. And because I'm a volcanologist, I, I need to put two slides of uh, geology settings, <laughs> geological context. So uh, the rift is formed because the Somalian plate and the Arabian plate are moving really slowly away from uh, the African plate. And this is forming in the upper part of the Rift Valley, a new, a new ocean. And as these two, um, the, the plates move apart, uh, it creates strings of volcanoes uh, because of the magmatism. And if we're focusing here in Ethiopia, in particular in the um, main Ethiopian rift, uh, which I will also refer as MER or MER, if you hear me say that, it's for main Ethiopian rift, which is uh, known to have had probably 60 volcanoes active during the Holocene, the, 12, the last 12,000 years, and that host about uh, 15 Pleistocene calderas. Just for the record, calderas are very big craters that form after very, very large eruptions. And um, as I tell my students, when we talk about large eruptions, we're not talking about the Eyjafjallajökull eruptions. We're talking about Pinatubo 1991 size onwards um, and bigger than that. And these eruptions until a few years ago um, were fairly poorly studied, in particular in the, the central part of Ethiopia. So um, one, one thing we focused on was dating um, all these calderas, all those big eruptions. Uh, so that was part of uh, our project and project of collaborators in um, a project led in, in Oxford by Oxford University. 
And what we have identified over the last years of study, and it's been a lot of work, is that there's been two major uh, eruptions or caldera forming eruptions in the mini Tupin Rift between around uh, 300 and 75,000 years ago. Um, as uh, we know, this period is relevant for the evolution of our ancestors in this very region. So when we think about the, these caldera forming eruptions, there would have been cataclysmic eruptions that would have drastically remodeled the landscape and covered the whole region over hundreds of kilometers in, in a radius of 100 kilometers with ash and blocks that would have necessarily affected the populations living in the region. Um, what's, what are volcanoes relevant for is that the, the, these products, they travel, um, can, they can travel very far in the landscape, sometimes thousands of kilometers away. And the, what we call the, the ash, we also call tephra. So if you hear me saying tephra or tough, you can think about volcanic ash if you're not familiar with the word. And because we can date uh, those tephra, those layers, we can provide constraints for sites uh, um, where we can find art, uh, archaeological and paleoanthropological remains. So they are a very useful tool. I'll come slightly into detail about that later on. And there are many, uh, well, several region or formations in the uh, in Ethiopia, where the, that have been really important to study archaeology and paleoanthropology, and they are the form the the, the for, these four formations, and also the Chabaha Lake, um, which was talked in uh, about in great length in a seminar three years ago, by uh, Verena Foster, who's here online with us today. I'm going to review briefly those sites and what is important in those sites for the work we've done. So the northernmost site uh, is the Herto um, site, where was retrieved the, the, the Herto hominins, which are the, the second oldest um, hominin in, in Ethiopia. And they are dated, uh, they are found below a layer called the WAVT, or Wadedo uh, Vitric Tuff, um, which was correlated to another or tough in, in another formation called Conso, which I'll, I'll introduce later. So the only thing you need to know here, not all the ages, you can remember WAVT, which is the tephra that covers the hominids at, at Herto. If we travel uh, in the central part of the mini Tripen Rift, we might stop at Gadimota, which is a, a formation uh, very famous for its uh, Middle Stone Age assemblages, dated around uh, 275 and 100,000 years. And there are three um, major ash units in this formation. The most important today is Unit D, dated 184,000 years. Everything I'm talking about here is previous work. It's not the dating that, that we've done. Now, if we go even further south, um, we stop at Conso. Conso is a fantastic library uh, for, uh, it's a fantastic volcanic archives. It, it contains a lot of ash layers from uh, way before, uh, before the, the Pleistocene. And the topmost part of the, of the, the formation contains um, ash layers that we will talk about uh, today. So they are um, TA55, TA56, and the SVT or silver uh, tuff. This is the one we see here on the picture, just below the feet of my collaborators, Christine Lane and Aswa Wilson Asra. Um, so, and last but not least, the Omo Kibish Formation, um, fantastic playground for anyone who loves sediments. It's also really beautiful. Um, it's um, a region that also contains, includes a lot of um, ash layers. And it's mostly famous because this is where we uh, retrieve the, the remains of uh, three hominins, including Homo I, which is in Eastern Africa, the oldest um, Homo sapiens fossil uh, found. And I'm going to explain more in detail how these hominins were, uh, this hominin Homo I was dated before. So the age, uh, what the accepted age for this hominin was around 197. It was a maximum age, 1,000 years based on the age of a tuff, so this um, ash layer, that was reported to, quote unquote, lie um, uh, near and probably below um, the layer in which the, the fossils were discovered. But because of the uncertain position 
uh, stratigraphic placement of this stuff. There's been a lot of attention on the KHS stuff, which is a widespread, over two meters thick, very fine-grained um, ash layer, the Kamoya Ominin site, that's why uh, KHS stands for. Um, however, the dating using argon argon of this tephra hasn't been possible because it's too fine-grained. So um, there's been attempts to correlate this stuff, the KHS stuff, with other stuff because we know that it lies directly uh, or uh, not directly, but it lies above, in section, it lies above the Omu one remains. And based on published correlations, uh, former studies suggested that the KHS stuff in the Kibish formation was uh, correlated to the unit TA55 at the Consul formation, unit D at the Gademota for formation, and the WAVT at Herto, which all the, the tephra I've mentioned before. The conclusion of that was that both oldest Homo sapiens fossil in Ethiopia would lie under the same stratigraphic uh, horizon, which means that they would be fairly close in age. So when you're volcanologist, the first thing you think about is if there is a tephra that's widespread from near the Kenyan border all the way to Erto, and that's nearly 800 kilometers, given the thickness reported, uh, the reported thickness of the deposit in the literature, you can ask a lot of questions because we would be looking for a very, very, very big eruption. There should be remains of that eruption. So two hypotheses, either we have several eruptions or the tufts are not correlated. So this is a bit where we started to investigate. I just, before uh, we move on, I need to mention the remarkable uh, record of the Chobaha core, which was talked about in detail uh, by Verena a few uh, months ago that has retrieved over 600,000 years of environmental history, but also contains many uh, layers, uh, not necessarily visible uh, layers of ash. We also talk about crypto tephra when we can't see um, the ash, but because of the, the good resolution of the record, um, it um, can and help us uh, bring a lot of information on the eruptive history. It's a great volcanic record for the area, including for Kenya as well. So before I move on, uh, I need to talk about tephrochronology maybe for about one minute and bear uh, in mind that this is like a, a, a one slide summary of a two hour lecture I give to postgraduate students. So if you're really unfamiliar, put your seatbelt on and I'll try to be as concise as possible. Tephrochronology relies on the deposition of ash produced by volcanoes, which um, is deposited over uh, months, weeks, months to probably years, but on the geological timescale, it's considered as instantaneous. This ash can travel very far, as I've mentioned before, hundreds to sometimes thousands of kilometers. And in theory, ideally, each eruption would have a unique geochemical fingerprint that characterizes the pathway of the magma towards the surface, which is uh, fairly unique for each eruption. That's in theory. We will see that in practice, it's slightly more complicated. So the phrenology, the idea is that we identify the geochemical fingerprint of an ash layer somewhere, and we can see if we can correlate with the fingerprint of another ash layer, tephra or tuff, somewhere else. So potentially we can link archives together, we can link um, sites, archaeological sites together, and we can also potentially link them to a specific volcanic source. Now, um, this tephrochronology is limited by several things um, that includes, and it's not the exhaustive list, but the grain size of the material. If it's too small, we won't be able to date with argon-argon the, the deposit, which was the case for the KHS stuff. Um, if it's too small, the analysis of some uh, elements in trace abundances, which are key to understand the fingerprint, might not be possible. And then the degree of alteration of the deposit and therefore of the ash grain um, can be a problem because it can alter the, the, the composition of some elements and therefore it can skew some correlations. Finally, uh, it's great to have an uh, in-depth understanding of a tephra somewhere or a fingerprint. Now, if we if the record around or in the region around hasn't haven't been 
studied in as much detail, we can't necessarily correlate with anything. So it, it would be limited to how much work has been done in the region around. I hope this um, makes sense. So now back to our revised record of eruptions in the mini Tupin Rift. Um, and there's a lot of eruptions. The question is, how do we link with the, these eruptions with all the distal sites? And I'm going to, before showing correlations, I just want to talk about what, uh, what is the fingerprint of all these eruptions. So we're talking here about all the proximal deposits of this eruption that was published in, a, in the second paper in Quaternary Science Reviews in the last summer. The way we characterize volcanic deposits is by looking at oxides of some elements, which you can see here. And as I mentioned, normally each eruption would have a different geochemical composition. Now you will see that for some regions, there is an overlap when we look at these elements. Sometimes alteration, for example, could affect the concentration in sodium. And so we can't use those elements as uh, for comparison. However, um, some other elements might be more critical to um, separate the eruptions, such as the oxides of aluminum, uh, calcium, titanium, and uh, iron. But most importantly, having analysis of trace elements is where we can ideally really um, um, isolate the fingerprint of a specific deposit. The complexity here is that the analytical setup for the analysis should be, uh, in theory, reproducible um, for everything that is studied. So it's difficult to compare a data set acquired in certain condition, analytical conditions with a data set that hasn't been acquired with the same conditions. So it means that for everything that's been done before, it might be difficult to correlate with new data. I hope that, that makes sense. Um, so there's a lot of eruptions here. We're going only to focus on um, two eruptions. The, the eruption of Shala, uh, 233,000 years ago. So Shala is the largest caldera uh, visible or preserved caldera of the Main Ethiopian Rift. It's about 15 kilometers wide. So for the record, uh, as a limit of comparison, the Tambora eruption in 1815 created a caldera that was eight kilometers wide. So it's like, it, this one is two, um, twice as, as big. Um, so you can have an idea of how, how um, how cataclysmic, how, how big would have been the, uh, the eruptions that would have formed this caldera. And there is the, the eruption of Corbeti, we will talk about. So it's the, the volcanic system just south of Shala uh, that formed the caldera 177,000 years ago. We can only see the, the rims in some parts of the, of the system because the, the rest would have been covered with more recent activity of the volcano, unlike uh, what we see at Shala. The deposits of this eruption of Corbeti are reported as yellow triangles here on those plots. And we see that they overlap three other deposits. So one of them is um, a cryptotephra layer in the Chabaha core, which are the red circles. And this layer, according to the age model of the core, would be 176,000 years. So we have a good match with the dates. Good, the age model is, is working. Uh, so we're very excited, happy about that. Um, two other layers it, it overlaps are the TA56 unit at CONSO, one of the formations, and also um, another layer which we identified at Kibish, the layer 1808. And this layer, this ash, is found just above the, the key KHS tuff. So just as a reminder of the stratigraphy, the hominids were found below the KHS stuff. There is a KHS stuff, and we, we, we identified this layer. I mean, it was probably identified before, but not correlated to anything. So we, we resampled and characterized and um, to compare with our data set. So the fact that we identified a layer above KHS that is dated 177,000 years means that the KHS stuff is older than that. So the HOMO, the HOMO one is even older than that. So far, within the uncertainty, we're still in the range of what was the age that was suggested for Omo one Now, um, this is where the Shala eruption comes in. 
So this eruption was first um, characterized in the field by Paul Moore in the 80s, and there hasn't been uh, work done on, on shallow volcano after that, uh, at least not on the volcanolog volcanological aspect. We're talking about an eruption that produced deposits over 20 meters. It's over uh, a six-story building, so it's really, really big eruption. You can see all the deposits here. The dating uh, using argon-argon of these deposits from the base to the top provided an, a mean age of 233,000 years. And if we look at the composition of those deposits reported here as triangles, the brown, uh, full and empty triangles, and also black triangles, we see on our plots that they overlap the blue diamonds, which, are, which represent the composition of the KHS stuff. And this cluster, is different from the cluster of the Corbetti eruption and its correlative. What is also important here is that the composition of the KHS and the Shala deposits are different from the composition of the Unit D at Gademota, which was previously associated to the KHS stuff based on uh, correlations from data in the literature. So, What's here, basically, we provide two uh, age constraints for the Kibish formation, that we have the we have the Corbett eruption lying over the KHS stuff, which we know lies over um, OMO-1. Now, if we add, these are, I, I just talked about two correlations. We, we've worked on much more. This is a more complicated diagram. We have like uh, three formations and the Chobaha record. And we have here the list of all the eruptions. And we've, we've been able to establish some links between um, sometimes more than two uh, sites, which is um, very exciting and promising as well for the future. Uh, we have encored, um, we've, we've identified more layers at the, at the Kibish formation, which changes a little bit the, the history as well of the deposition in, in that basin. So the implications of those correlations basically is that we don't have a single ash that covers the two hominins from the north to the south of Ethiopia. Uh, we know that we're not sure that there is a correlation between KHS and TA55. Um, I have realized TA55 recently. At the time the publication was done, we had uh, samples that was too altered to do any analysis. Um, so maybe a new paper coming soon, <laughs> working on that. But most importantly here, um, what it means is that we have a new minimum age for uh, OMO-1, which is 233,000 years, and let, uh, inst uh, instead of a maximum age of uh, 197,000 years. And um, also the, the correlations, or I would say the absence of correlations between KHS and T55 and uh, or KHS and, and unit D means that we, um, and the fact that we have identified TF56 as being correlative of the Corbetti eruption confirms the, the, the age range for the Herto hominins. I think there was something else I wanted to say here, but it's escaping me now. Maybe we'll come back in, in the questions. Um, but basically, what we see here is that the, the tephrostratigraphic lattice is much more complex. And um, it is complex when we realize everything a bit more sy systematically. Um, what, uh, what is coming next? Uh, we are working on extending all these stratigraphic correlations with TIFRA from afar, including all the TIFRA at Herto. And um, maybe we will be able to identify maximum age for OMO-1. The, the biggest, um, the most promising here is the, the analysis of crypto TIFRA from the Chobaha core, which is uh, a lot, um, a lot, a lot of work. Uh, but because it has a really good resolution, the Chubaha core, maybe we'll be able to refine um, the, the ages as well, because we, as you see with Argon Argon, we have some large uncertainties so far in what we have. And possibly with um, combining the, the volcanological history with the paleoclimate date, uh, data from Chubaha core, we might be able to explore uh, the nexus between hominin and climate and volcanoes, or at least between volcanoes and environment. Uh, just to play around, uh, I took this uh, figure from um, Verena's paper uh, discussed in a, in a former seminar, a webinar, and I've plotted all the eruptions we've identified. And these are just the Ethiopia eruptions. 
um, if we put in all the Kenya eruptions, it would be interesting ultimately to think about the relations between changes in the environment. Although we will be we have a big issue with the resolution um, because the timing of the impact of eruptions is usually it might not be something that can be picked up in the record, um, or it might uh, the the resolution of the record might not be good enough. But it's uh, some idea for the future. So I'm going to leave it here so we have some time to, to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Celine. Well done. That was, uh, yeah, super exciting. And I, I, to be honest with you, I had no, I, I didn't realize there were so, such big volcanoes that were going off. I mean, I knew there was volcanism, obviously, but like the scale of it, that was, that was yeah, I wasn't, didn't appreciate that. Um, mm. <laughs> great. Uh, so I learned something. So that's also, also nice. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we open up to questions. Um, anybody out? There? I think there was a um, there was a, a message question which I think came yeah. in. Oop, no, I've lost that. No, I don't want to create a quiz or a poll chat. There's a question from Neil Edwards via the chat, which says, the latest argon-argon dating techniques use laser ablation ICPMS and can date micron-sized grains. Is the dating still not possible at that resolution? Sorry, I have to go to a meeting. Okay. Uh, so, so, so we, we can answer some feedback to Neil at another time. Uh, I can just add one word of that. Yes, this is right. And um, I am sending samples to colleagues to, in Canada uh, mm -hmm. to do some uranium um, dating on on finer grain um, de deposits, and we hope. So it depends on what is what type of, of minerals are available. We need zircons in in the deposits, and um, we hope very promising results. It's not it's not sure the the uncertainty would be better, but at least we might be able to date things that uh, are very fine grain. Great. Okay, uh, Daniel, you've got your hand up. Please uh, ask your question. Yes, I do. Thank you. Let me put on my video for the moment. Uh, Celine, thanks very much for, for that interesting talk. I noted that for uh, the correlation, you relied quite a lot on the aluminium uh, and iron oxide mm. correlations. Um, do you think that that remains a very robust way in which to have that discrimination? And uh, to what extent uh, did you actually use the, the trace elements to, to kind of fortify those arguments that you make. Mm. Yes, thank you, uh, Daniel. And it's very important here. So, um, yeah, because uh, I, because it's not a tephrochronology or geochemistry talk, I didn't go so much into the details. The trace elements here are key to separate the deposits because although um, the, we have few elements we can work with because of the nature of the magma. And in other places, people can use many more elements. Here we have um, aluminum and iron are the elements that, that have the, the largest viability in the deposits of the main Ethiopian rift. And we see the rest, calcium, titanium, are very similar from one volcano to another and from one eruption to another, which is not very helpful. So this is where we need uh, trace elements. So ultimately, the correlations rely or we can affirm correlations only because we have trace elements. But um, obviously, the if there is no correlation with major elements, it's not even, um, it means that there's no correlation at all. But there, within the uncertainty from one eruption to another, even sometimes uh, iron and aluminum can be very similar. So if I had plotted everything on the plot, we would just see a big cloud, basically. So that's why. Yeah, in the way I, I present, I just show what I think is uh, what uh, we found is correlated with the trace elements, but it, it's only the trace element that, that um, led us to conclusions. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I, yeah. I had a, oh, sorry, who was that? Yes, Emma. Emma, you go for it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Celine. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, my question is uh, rather general. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to find out, you know, while there is, a, a, you know, at the time when there is so much volcanicity, volcanicity on the side of Ethiopia, 
I'm interested to know what is happening on the Kenyan side, because you know, uh, Kenya is very close to Ethiopia. And uh, just to mention that uh, late Pleistocene sediments are not, uh, you know, are quite few, particularly in the Lake Turkana Basin. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to know, you know, um, why so much you know, volcanic uh, activities on the side of Ethiopia yet sediments of the same time period are lacking down south? So, yeah, yeah thank you, Emma, for your question. Um, there is probably, um, I'm not going to say as much because we don't know, but Kenya was also, the, the Kenyan rift was also very active volcanically during this time period. And the eruptions, all the, the major eruptions haven't been studied so much. So it's not, it, because we don't know, doesn't mean that they are not there, but they, of, of course they have occurred and there hasn't been as much focus in Kenya that has been in Ethiopia in the, in the recent years to study this specific volcanism. I'm not sure I understood your question about the sediments. Could uh, um, we this part, please? Yeah, I just, uh... You know, the Lake Trucana Basin, if you are conversant with it, you know, so much work has been done there for close to 50,000 years. Mm -hmm. where, are, where else we know um, the earlier sediments, you know, the Pliocene and uh, probably uh, up to probably 1 million years. Uh, the Pleistocene, what we can call place, uh, the Pleistocene sediments are lacking in that basin. Yes. Yeah, because, you know, whenever we look for fossils, which are homo sapiens, you know, the earliest homo sapiens, the time period of Halto, mm -hmm. Konzo, and the rest, Buya in Ethiopia. The sediments where those fossils derive from in Ethiopia are missing in the Lake Turkana Basin. So yes. I was interested just to know what type, uh, you know, what could have, uh, you know, uh, resorted in that time period, mm. uh, missing in the Trukana Basin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Emma. I, uh, I mean, this is a very important question. And um, working now much older on Pliocene tephra in, in Turkana, I have the same interrogations. Um, that's a bit beyond my field of expertise. And I don't know if we have a definite answer of why Pliocene uh, the, uh, sediments are, are missing, especially, I don't know, in the east, but in the west of the Turkana Basin. Um, if anyone else has a, a cue on that, I'll be that'd be helpful. But I I don't know if we have uh, an answer for that, Emma. I definitely don't have a clear one. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Does anyone want to jump in on that? No. Okay. Any any other questions for Celine? Tom. Celine, I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm involved with still working away on the Lake Malawi Drill Corps. And, you know, we could certainly uh, improve the chronology of that core were some more tephra found in the age range between 75,000 and 500,000 years ago. Are, are there any groups working in the Rungwe volcanoes to try to improve the tephra chronology of the region that you're um. aware of? I know my, my, my colleague Karen Fontin is, has been working in Tanzania and Kenya, working on refining yeah, the, the probably more Holocene activity in Tanzania and, and Kenya for all those big, big eruptions. And um, my colleague Christine Lane, who leads the, the Tephrochronology Lab in, in, in Cambridge, is also involved in uh, many of those projects. So um, I think it's more um, a question of the working with the sediments from the from the cores re requires a lot it's a lot of labor <laughs> i know it well <laughs> yeah 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 so um but there's been uh, i know yeah christine has been involved in that and, and and but more working on proximal deposits uh, karen Font fontaine has been involved in yeah. those eruptions with with a few phd students as well yes okay thank so you so just sort of following on from that question from tom i mean you talked about the microterfers. I mean, what's the 
what's the opportunities, chances do you see of joining up some of these long lake drill cores? I mean, I work on Bazumtui, we've got all the East African lake, like of, of finding those micro tephras in multiple lakes. So we have a, a kind of hard tie point across. Is that like how much of a, a, a realizable dream would it be to have a control point that goes east to West Africa, like using these these micro tephras? Could, could we potentially find them or are the wind dispersal patterns and things just not likely to be favorable for this? I don't, I, I have no idea. Um, I, I, it's a really good question. And I think the, the wind patterns are so key here. Um, sure. And because the problem is that from one period to another, the wind patterns might change. And also the wind patterns, what distribute the tephra depends on how high an ash plume would go. So an ash plume reaching um, 40 kilometers or even 50 kilometers in the stratosphere, like we saw the Tonga eruption in January last year, or 20 kilometers um, would be hit, the plume would be hit by different winds. So the direction of the winds might be different. So I think this is, fairly unpredictable. If we're looking at a, a large period of time, it's very difficult to say. Um, yeah, so it, it would be amazing to link east, east and west, but I think just within the east, we already have a lot of work linking all the sediment cores together um, already there, yeah. Okay, yeah, we uh, in our collaboration with Christine Lane, um, uh, through Christine's lab, we were able to identify the toba ash in yes. Lake Malawi. And that should certainly show up in some of the other East African lakes as well. It's the yes. first time it was found on the African continent. Yes, yeah. So we have, um, it was identified in the in the Shalako. Um, Shala is, was, is um, oh. drilled just near um, Kilimanjaro. And we have a PhD student working on the toba tof and looking for it in a Chobaha core as well. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Super exciting. But again, uh, the the it's not just the wind; it's also how big the eruption would be in volume. Because we found a top everywhere because this is such a large amount of ash released in uh, in the atmosphere that it's more likely to be found. Mm -hmm. Even an eruption like the one of Shala showed, um, even if it travels far away, it would be just a small quantity. So if we find two shards in the sediment really uh, in a sediment core, um, 2,000 kilometers away would be great. Um, but we're not talking about the volumes of the, the Toba eruption, which is a two order of magnitudes bigger, probably. But also several thousand kilometers farther away, too. Yeah, yeah, but we can find more than one because it's been bigger, yeah, <laughs> this far. OK, I think we have one more question in the chat from uh take a new uh thank you for the excellent talk given the change in the age of the khs tough to older than 200k what is the status of the tough underlying the omo one skull any change or it remains the same what are the implications given the stratigraphic positioning so we haven't found this stuff uh, we've looked everywhere. We've looked at the place where it was described to be found, and uh, we haven't found it. So there's there's the date. This stuff, the situation of this stuff is, and the dating is a bit more complex. What was dated were pumices uh, that were not found in the tuff. It's called the Nakakiri tuff. The pumices that were dated were not find uh, found in the tuff that is in section. So there was a, it was a correlation with the tuff and the position of this stuff relative to the, the Obo one is uncertain. So we have a lot of uncertainties there and we haven't been, I mean, we looked for the, the Nakakiri tuff in the field, we haven't been able to identify it. So the, the next step uh, here is to get some samples of Nakakiri tuff by someone who um, identi identified it, probably working with Frank Brown or the team or Craig Feeble um, and analyze it to actually see the fingerprint. Um, and yeah, hopefully, hopefully we would be able to, to refine that. I'm not quite sure this would be the strongest uh, maximum constraint because of the uncertain stratigraphic position. There is another tough much layer in the sequence that we have uh, analyzed so far. We haven't uh, found it a correlative to, to this one. Maybe in a few years when we when we um, accidentally find the, the equivalent in the Chobaha, Core, we will have that, that age. 
Um, so there's a, I mean, as much as we tried, we work on some correlations, there's a, um, we, we get surprises. Some of the correlations we, we find uh, accidentally, which is always a nice surprise. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, do we have any final question for Celine? Because I think we're getting towards the end of our time slot. If not, I would all I'd like to note before people go away and we finally thank Celine that our next talk is on the 7th of February. So it's it's a little bit uh, just a few weeks away. And Cecile Blanchett, who I think is in the in the online audience today, uh, will be giving that talk on um, ancient river forms uh in africa so uh we can look forward to hearing cecile in uh a few weeks time i would like to thank uh celine uh for an excellent talk uh and really fun uh to think about these these um volcanics and uh, the the deposits and i was like uh, yeah thinking about crypto tephras in Bazumtwi could be could be quite exciting so uh Thank you very much for that. And uh, see you guys all next time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.